Now coming back to the forces, joint ejection force. We have already discussed that joint ejection force is the sum of all forces that are acting inside the joint here. It will include the forces that are acting in this direction and also in the forces that are acting in opposite direction. So it's sum total of all forces. In general, on standing each femoral head is supporting half of the body weight because during standing the body weight gets distributed on both the sides. And during the gait, whenever the limb enters the single leg stance, since the effective lever arm of the abductor muscles is shorter than the effective lever arm of the body weight what happens when see this is the lever arm of the abductor that is a and this is the lever arm of the body weight that means b now if the patient is supporting the body only on this side then automatically the center of the body weight which was earlier in midline will now shift towards the upper side why because the opposite side of the hemi pelvis is no more supported so automatically the b magnitude will increase so this lever arm will fall further short of the b therefore the force required to balance the body weight will now be higher and you can simply use this equation a into ab should be equal to b into w to support the body weight ab is the abductor pull if you are increasing the b that is during the single limb stance then automatically the ab is going to be increase b is always going to be more than a and in case of single limb stance it is going to be further higher so therefore the force required will be definitely more than body weight now just remember some points of the joint ejection force the peak joint ejection forces can reach up to around five times of the body weight the joint ejection force in single leg raise test is two times body weight it is three times body weight when the, their single leg stance why because then the lever arm is around two times of the lever arm here joint ejection force will be weight of the body and the abductor force so abductor force is going to be two times of the body weight while extra body weight which is acting directly on in this direction will add up so the joint ejection force is going to be around three times of body weight while in walking it is go it may reach to five times body weight while in running it may reach up to 10 times of the body weight just remember these points there is no need for calculation for calculation part just remember this formula that the lever arm multiplied by the forces should be equal whenever there is need for balance between the two sides of the fulcrum the fulcrum here is the hip joint now just remember that the maximum contact pressure occurs at the antero superior part of the femoral head why see in most part of the gait cycle you see the hip is mostly flexed and whenever the hip is flexed you see the antero superior part of the femoral head is going to be in line with the weight transmission therefore that is the part which is bearing most of the stress during the walking while in estabulum you see the pelvis is mostly anti-verted that means it is tilted more towards the anterior side during walking and therefore the posterior superior part this part is going to be most affected during the gait cycle or you can say walking so the stress area is the posterior superior part therefore in arthroplasty we need to ensure that the posterior superior part is always covered because otherwise there are chances of dislocation in the posterior superior part because that is the part where the stress is acting most and as far as the peak stresses are concerned it it occurs first in the early stance phase here look at the light green side here because the heel is going to strike the ground and there will be sudden transmission of the axial force in this direction towards the hip joint and the second peak occurs in the late stance phase because because that is the time when the heel pushes off the ground and there is again transmission of the axial force towards the hip joint so therefore these two points the early stance and the late stance have the peak stresses one due to axial transmission of the body weight when touching the ground and one when there is need of push off of the body away from the ground now when selecting the processes for orthoplasty you need to see the fit wear and durability so the durability refers to the longevity of the implant while wear refers to the release of debris due to regular uses of the joint interfaces in active patients we want low wear rates because then only the longevity or you can say durability is going to be good in low molecular weight polythene liner with a metal femoral head the, the wear rate is around 200 microns per year while in ultra highly cross-linked polythene with metal head it is going to be 20 microns per year metal with metal heads that's 4.2 microns per year but the issue with the metal heads is the release of metal ions even though debris is small the less number of metal ions can result in metallosis 
can cause local tissue reactions also and then ultimately they can be local destruction or you can say aseptic loosening of the components can occur the newer components that are widely used are the ceramic ones they have self-polishing properties that means they are scratch resistant and the good thing about them is that the wear rate is very small it is almost negligible that is less than one micron per year therefore in younger patients the ceramic components are preferred however the ceramic components are thought to be brittle that means they have risk of stress fracture so and some other points that need to be concerned we have already discussed those points that the abductor tension needs to balance the body weight and the lever arm of the body weight during the gait cycle and whenever the pelvis is wide then automatically the body weight lever arm is going to be more medial therefore larger moment will be there the moment is, is nothing but the force multiplied by the lever arm so to balance the moment here there should be equal moment here as well so the abductor tension into a should be equal to b into body weight as i have already discussed and reduced antiversion of either acetabulum or femoral neck can result in higher joint reaction force why because this fulcrum is going to be inefficient there is less amount of surface area which is available for joint reaction we will see in the coming slide and then there is a concept of combined antiversion which is around 37 degree which prevents any impingement throughout the range of motion of the hip joint and also it ensures that the it ensures that the surface area of weight transmission is good enough to avoid any stress concentration in any particular region so the clinical uses of combined antiversion has been determined to be between 25 and 35 degree in men and up to 45 degree in women so let's come to the concept of combined antiversion so you see so when we are measuring the inclination of acetabulum from a central line then the angle is around 23 degree while the antiversion of the femoral head that means the central neck line compared to a vertical line it is around 15 degree so the version of the acetabulum is around 23 degree that means the acetabulum is tilted 23 degree 23 degree anteriorly while the femoral neck you see the axis of femoral neck is tilted 15 degree when compared to a straight horizontal surface so the combined antiversion is nothing but the sum of this antiversion and this antiversion so it is around it's going to be around 38 degree in this case now what happens suppose if you have fixed the acetabulum in slightly retro version that means whenever the patient is going to perform the internal rotation movement this part this part is going to impact on this part this will result in impingement and automatically the range of motion will also decrease and what happens when you increase the antiversion then what will happen the posterior part will hit the posterior part of the femoral head that means then there will be reduced external rotation there will be impingement in this zone therefore whenever you are performing the total hip arthroplasty suppose you have to increase the version of acetabulum so in this case it is slightly increased if you have to increase the version of acetabulum then you have to reduce the antiverse of the proximal femur so that there is minimal impingement between the femoral head and the margins of the acetabulum so there comes the concept of combined antiversion suppose if you have added retroversion to the acetabulum then the antiversion of the proximal femur needs to be increased that means femoral head should face somewhere here it should not, not lie here and in this part also if we have increased the antiversion of the acetabulum then we need to increase the retroversion of the proximal femur that means the head should now be tilted in this direction so that there will be no impingement in this area while this part it was impingement free already but now extra part of the femoral head will go inside this coverage is going to be better now additionally i've told you that that change in the version of either acetabulum or femoral head can result in reduced area of the forces transmission see in this example increasing the retro version of the acetabulum what we have done what we have done we have uncovered this part of the femoral head and by increasing the anti version we have uncovered this part of the femoral head so automatically the forces that need to be transmitted are not uniform now therefore there is going to be reduced area for force transmission that will result in extra wear 
when arthroplasty is performed so, so therefore it needs to be so therefore it is important to understand the concept of combined antiversion in arthroplasty now femoral head diameter articular clearance and cup orientation so whenever the clearance is high it will reduce the contact patch area so high clearance means that the joint surfaces are not congruent and there is extra space between the femoral head component and the acetabular component so automatically the surface which is going to be in contact between the two surfaces is going to be less therefore the contact patch area is going to be less on the contrary whenever the clearance is low like in this picture the forces are going to be transmitted through a larger surface area however there will be risk of edge loading why because contact patch will now extend beyond the articular extent of the acetabulum so there are chances of edge loading that means the edge of the articular component is getting loaded by the force and that can result in extra wear why because whenever there is sudden change in the area of stress distribution like here there is area of high stress and there on the outside there is no area for stress distribution this area will behave as the area of stress concentration and automatically the wear is going to be high this is known as edge loading because the contact patch area is extending beyond the articular extent of the acetabular component and this usually happens whenever the acetabular component is actually rotated medially as compared to the weight bearing axis therefore the inclination of the component acetabular component needs to be higher so that this contact patch area gets covered now you see this part of the acetabular component is almost useless it is not helping in weight transmission well we needed this area on this side to just to ensure that the contact patch has the acetabular component over it so as loading occurs when the contact patch between the head and cup extends over the cup rim and it can be corrected by increasing the abduction of the acetabular cup so a cup abduction angle of 45 degree or less is recommended to avoid excessive wear this angle is around 60 degree we need to reduce it to less than 45 degree so that this contact patch area gets covered